Hi, and in this short video we're going to start looking at social change during the 1960s under Wilson's government. The 1960s is often described as the swinging 60s, a time of being changed, very hip, very fashionable, lots of new things happening. And what I want to start doing is looking at the idea of essentially what is happening during that period. I want to really start understanding whether that change is happening for everyone? Is it happening for different groups at different rates? And are certain groups of society not seeing any change at all? So this first video is really going to start exploring that idea and I've broken it down into a number of key areas for you to have a look at and I'll bring a slide up now to help you understand how this is going to break down during this short video. And you'll see what I've got I'm going to be starting to look at. We'll look at television and media We'll look at travel and holidays, look at technology, look at fashion and housing and domestic life. So if we start at essentially television and media, you'll understand that people have got televisions, not everybody, but the television exists, it's how people are getting the news, it's how the latest technology is. And what we need to understand is how does that widen, how does that grow over that period? So the first thing I'm going to put in front of you is a slide that shows you how the number of television licenses increases over that period. And you'll see that by 1965 we've got over 13 million television licenses all the way through to 1971 and 90% of the population has access to a television. So if 90% of the population have access to a television, 1965 we've got 13 and a half million or just under 13 and a half million people with access to a television, you need to be able to understand what does that mean. That means that entertainment's going to change, that means what people see, how they form a view of the world is going to change. You need to understand that. That's part of being an A-level student, is making that analysis, not just repeating the facts, making the connection. So, number of TV licenses increases, what does this mean? How does that change how people see their news? How does that change leather, um, leisure activity? But we'll make those connections later on as well. So we're going to move on. The director of BBC, Hugh Green, is modern and progressive. His ideas, he's really looking at this idea of the BBC now being not only about education, it's also about entertainment. And we'll look at an example of that later on in another video when we look at Come Home Kathy and a film that is broadcast on BBC. Um, TV, ITV has allowed advertising to grow, so does the prevalence of independent television, this idea of advertising, this idea of consumerism. We see BBC Two starting in 1964, which frees up BBC One to become populist. And by that I mean entertainment for the masses, what the people want to see. We're not now just talking about this education idea for public service broadcasting. We're talking about now BBC One being populist, i.e. it's going to show programmes that people want to watch on Friday night, on Saturday night in front of the television as a family. Whereas BBC Two is going to show more of your educational programmes, your documentaries, what could almost be described as your highbrow programmes but you're going to see this diversion now between BBC One and BBC Two. Um, the other one that you see as well is this idea of the small portable transistor radio. Now except in today we listen to digital radio, we have radio on our phones, we have it on watches, there's numerous ways we can listen to radio, podcasts and things like that. However, back in the 1960s the idea of being able to listen to radio in a small portable device that took batteries was revolutionary and you start to see the growth of radio stations as well so we don't then just have the BBC we start to see independent radio and LBC London um, Broadcasting Company is the first independent radio station in this country but not only that you're seeing the idea of pirate radio radio stations that are just off the coast in international waters of the United Kingdom but broadcasting on powerful enough transmitters so they can be heard in the UK. A good example of that is Radio Caroline which is broadcasting pop music which is becoming more and more popular and that changes what Radio 1 starts to broadcast as well because they see this change. And then finally 
we've got the Sun newspaper. It's been called Daily Herald up until that point. It's then bought out. It's initially bought out by one group and it doesn't do very well as the Sun. And then in 1964, a gentleman called Rupert Murdoch appears on the scene. He buys the Sun newspaper and that really transforms that newspaper. It moves from being a left-wing newspaper to a more centrist position and then moves across more to a right-wing position over time. And you also need to understand as a result the difference between how television media is censored, how television media is expected to meet certain guidelines and how print media, newspapers, don't have that same constraints. And to help you, I've brought a slide up in front of you to show you those differences. So if you look at this slide, you'll see that with television, they're legally required to be politically neutral. And that means they've got to give a balanced um, view of events. They can't give an opinion. Whereas newspapers are allowed to be politically biased. They're allowed to give their own opinion. And this means that a number of newspapers are owned by a small group of what are described as press barons. These families who own a number of newspapers and are able to put forward their view on the world. And also because newspapers are popular, that opinion gets quite widely spread as well. Okay, so having looked at newspapers and having looked at this idea of media, what I want to do now is look at travel and leisure. And what we start to see is the growth of the package holiday. In the 1950s, we had the de Havilland Comet aircraft, which had been developed. It wasn't a hugely successful aircraft. However, it shows what is possible. It opens the door up to other international travel. And over this period, we see international travel increase from 4% up to about 8.4%. And I'll bring a slide up in a moment to show you that. And it, Whilst that doesn't seem significant, it is the start of something bigger. We see Britannia Airways, an airline that is created in 1964 over amalgamations and combining with different airlines, they eventually become TUI, who exists today. But also what we see is in the UK, we see changes in how people are going on holiday. Up until this point, holidays to places like Butlin's holiday camps, Ponting's holiday camps have been very popular. However, they're becoming less so with the advent of international travel and also there are issues going on with teenage culture during those um, holiday camps as well. So we're seeing that starting to change, how people are going on holiday is becoming something that's quite different. Next, I want to look at fashion in the 1960s. And it's a very brief overview, but essentially what you're starting to see is London being recognised as a hub of the swinging 60s, an iconic city, not just in this country, but around the world. And again, I've brought some information up for you to see, but you'll see that it is described as the most exciting city in the world by the American writer John Crosby. He wrote for newspapers at the time. We see models such as Twiggy, Jane Shrimpton, and they're on the cover of international magazines. And then we've got Michael Caine, Sean Connery, who are famous actors, and then David Bailey and Lloyd Snowden. Lloyd Snowden, he was the son-in-law, sorry, he was the brother-in-law to the Queen. He was married to Princess Margaret. So you see how this is crossing across all areas of society, this idea of the swinging 60s, of London being a very hip and cool place to be at that time. So having looked at that, what I want to do now is start looking at home life and domestic life. And how does that change? How do we see home ownership increasing? How do we see the ownership of cars? How does that change domestic life during the 1960s? And you can see some information in front of you now to help you understand that. And what you see is essentially that supermarkets are becoming increasingly popular. Um, so by 1971, we've got two thirds of housewives making regular trips to them. And I'll just, you know, point out there, I'm saying housewives and being very specific there in doing that. We'll look at feminism, we'll look at the changing role and position of women in a later video. But I am making a specific point there. It is mainly housewives who are making the trips to the supermarket at that point. Home ownership is doubling from up to about 50% from just over 
Um, so that's the number of people that actually own their home or own their own home. It might be mortgaged, but they're no longer in social housing, council housing, or renting from a private landlord. Number of gardens has doubled up to 29 million gardens. So gardening becomes a leisure activity. Combined with that, you also see DIY, do it yourself, becoming a leisure activity as well. Because as people are owning their own homes, they're starting to wanting to maintain them, make changes to them, things like that. So we're seeing a change in le leisure activities now happening. Gardening, DIY, things like that are starting to take place. The number of cars on roads doubles from 2.3 million to 11.5 million. We see an increased road network. We see that starting to take place. More use of the motorways that are the newly built roads around the country. And then finally, what I've added onto there is the idea of the Mini. Designed in 1959 by um, Sir Alec Izigonis, um, but it was an iconic car of that period. So iconic, it was the star of its own film, essentially. 1969 film, The Italian Job, with Michael Caine, and it had three minis in the, in the film that were the iconic film, of the, the iconic cars of the time. One in red, one in white, one in blue. And it really gives you an idea of where Britain saw itself internationally, not just nationally, during this period. Looking at technology during this period, we could look at the post office tower that was built, and that was started in 1961. It was topped out 1965, and by that I mean that it was finally completed, it reached its full height, and then it was opened in 1966 by Tony Benn who was the cabinet minister at the time and he opened the post office tower. It's now known as BT Tower in London. Other things that happened during this period, we see Concorde starting to be developed, the Anglo-French project, the iconic supersonic aircraft, which would fly people around the world faster than the speed of sound. It, however, was hugely expensive and economically and commercially unviable. Um, which means it was never ever going to make a huge amount of money for the government or anybody that was flying the aircraft. So having had a look at that brief overview of Great Britain and the swinging 60s and uh, Harold Wilson's Labour government, what I want to do is close this video down by looking at the perspective from two different people at very different opposite ends of the swinging 60s and at different ends of England. We're going to start by looking at the perspective from Twiggy, a model who'd been on the cover of Vogue and famous international magazines. And her view of the 60s is as follows. Anything modern was wonderful and anything cold was terrible. It has a lot to do with the middle class suburban way of thinking. To review new things. Everything up to date, up to the minute. Brand new and streamlined. And contemporary. That's where everything has to be. Houses, home, decor, ornaments, clothes. In the 60s, anyway, everything had to be in fashion immediately and then out again, constantly changing. So Twiggy's really given us an insight here. And I think one of the key things to pick up on is that she's emphasizing this is a middle class driven thing. It's the middle class that wants everything to be contemporary up to date, the latest fashions, the latest style, and it's changing all the time. So from Twiggy's perspective, she's identifying this as a middle class thing. Next, I want to look at the perspective from an unknown woman in a village just outside Sunderland. And how does she describe this same period of time, the swinging 60s? Now she says, it took six months or more for anything fashionable to reach the northeast. London was well into minis. It was splashed everywhere that this revolution in dress had taken place before any of it reached us. It was a long time before minis made it up north. In fact, I think it was about 1966 or 1967 before they reached our village. There may have been more in Newcastle before then, but not in Sunderland. So there's a distinct difference here. This difference in geography saw so that the swinging 60s, this idea that the really hip, the fashionable thing, 
perhaps is only happening in London and in the southeast of England and as we move further away from there is it not happening to the same degree and this is really good evidence to support that argument so as students as A-level students you need, need to be able to do that identify is the swing in 60s is this social and cultural change affecting everybody to the same degree and here we've got evidence that geographical change can be an issue somebody in London is going to see it in a very different perspective to somebody who's living in a village just outside Sunderland now in subsequent videos we're going to look at how immigrants experienced the 1960s Great Britain how women experienced change during this period and how youth culture changes during this period as always click on subscribe to catch up with those videos when they get loaded onto here otherwise I'll leave it to it thanks a lot Bye-bye.